Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the complimentary webinar from ICMI, Knowledge-Centered Support as the Key to Great Service, sponsored by Oracle. I'm Sarah Steely-Reed, Content Director for ICMI, and I'm your host for today. Before we begin, let's do some quick housekeeping. First, I'll ask that you take a moment and disable your pop-up blockers if they're on. You'll also notice that there are several icons at the bottom of the console window. The first allows you to see the presentation slides, so make sure that one is maximized. Next is the Q&A icon. We'll be hosting a live Q&A throughout this webinar, and you can partici participate by asking questions at any time throughout the presentation. All you have to do is type in your question into that window and click Submit. Now, if you're experiencing any technical problems during the presentation, you can click the question mark icon on the console to access the event help guide. Clicking the other icons on the console will allow you to access our presenter bios, learn more about your sponsor Oracle, or find out about other upcoming ICMI webinars. You can also download a copy of today's presentation in PDF format. We encourage you to be social throughout this webinar. You can access your Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn accounts directly from the webinar console. All you have to do is log in and you can share your insights in any time. All right, and now I have the pleasure of introducing you to our esteemed panel of presenters today. Please welcome Paul Jay, the founder and director of Best Practice Establishment, Ashish Joshi, the Senior Director of Product Management for Oracle, and Monique Cadena, KCS Manager for Avaya. This group brings with them a wealth of KCS knowledge, no pun intended, and I expect that this is going to be an engaging and informative hour. Again, I encourage you to share what you learn here today by using our handles and hashtags. We'll remind you a couple more times throughout the presentation, so please don't be shy. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Paul. Thank you, Sarah. There's no doubt that having knowledge makes everything all right, but only when it's shared. Now, sharing knowledge is a cultural thing. Have you ever noticed how many yous are in the word culture? And there's also a your as well. This is important because a key tenet of KCS is that knowledge is not something that you do in addition to solving problems. Knowledge becomes the way you solve problems. So knowledge is a way, and it's the way that we do things around here. KCS stands for Knowledge Centred Support. It was developed in 1992 by the Consortium for Service Innovation, and you can download the KCS Practices Guide from their website. It's a solutions methodology that works off the simple premise of capture, structure, and reuse support knowledge. Now, most of us may have seen it all before, and no matter how much dedication, good intentions, and effort that we put in, it never seems to achieve the desired results and almost is always unsustainable. The consortium members understood this as well, so they set out to try and understand why so many knowledge implementations fail. The first thing that they noticed was that there was a general misunderstanding of what knowledge actually really was. They found that people seemed to have this utopian view of, what, of knowledge, and because everything was based on a false premise, their outcomes were unachievable from the start. Now, from literally thousands of hours of research, the consortium have identified four key attributes of knowledge. Number one, it's gained through interaction and experience, that it's constantly changing because we never stop learning. And because we never stop learning, our knowledge can never be 100% complete nor 100% accurate. They also found that knowledge was validated through use experience and interaction, and not by subject matter experts. Now let me ask you a question. Is this 
what people expect in your organisation when we say that we're implementing a knowledge base or a knowledge management practice? Do they expect it to be created as a result of interaction and experience, constantly changing, never complete, not absolutely accurate, and validated through use? Usually not. Unfortunately, people's expectation of a knowledge base or a knowledge management system is perfect pristine knowledge approved by experts. Now we have to change people's expectations if we really want to capitalise on the collective experience of the organisation. The next thing the consortium set out to do was to agree on a definition of knowledge. Though there be many valid reasons and valid definitions, the consortium agreed that a helpful definition would be information upon which I can act. KCS seeks to capture the collective experience of the organisation in ways that others can use, use or act on being the key point. So this definition is actually a verb, it's a doing word. This definition helps us clarify the difference between information and knowledge. For example, the long-range weather forecast for a businessman who works in the city is interesting information, but that's it. But that very same information for a farmer who works the land is actionable and he will use it to make decisions to plan his harvest. So what is information to one person is knowledge to another. This means that the information that we have in our knowledge base is really only potential knowledge and the usefulness of this information depends on the context, experience and the need of the person looking at it. So information becomes knowledge in the moment of use. Now it's insane to think that you can keep doing the same things the same way and expect to get different results. And after a number of failed attempts personally of trying to do knowledge management, me and my team, we realised we had to approach knowledge from a completely different perspective. This is because traditional knowledge management approaches had failed, especially when it comes to supporting services. Now, on the screen, you'll see a picture of a book that was published way back in the 90s simply titled The Future of Books. And you don't have to read very far before you come across some startling predictions. This was their prediction. Knowledge like this book has to be adaptable. It has to become more agile. It has to be interactive and collaborative. Static formal knowledge like e-books and training manuals and help files they're all good, but more often than not, they're out of date as soon as you put them into the knowledge base. And support analysts need to get We seem to have lost the audio for Paul. Uh, Paul, is it possible for you to dial back in or uh, you may have gone on mute? Paul has fallen off the bridge. He is dialing back in. Please hang on with us. Uh, Paul is actually dialing in from Sydney, Australia today, um, hence that little accent he has and uh, he'll be back on in just a moment. So my apologies, everyone. While we uh, are waiting for Paul, if you'd like to go ahead and send in any questions that you have about uh, knowledge, uh, please go ahead and do so now, and uh, we'll be prepared to answer those. 
If you have any questions uh, about knowledge uh, in general, about KCS in general, uh, or you know, directed specifically to Oracle or Avaya, uh, we can certainly you know, answer those questions while we're waiting for Paul to come hi, back. Hi, Paul, I'm back again. <laughs> and we have Paul. Thank you. Reliable Paul. Telecom, Sydney. <laughs> Highly recommended. <laughs> I'm just going to kick it right back on over to you. <laughs> Where was I up to? I was up to... Uh, slide everyone... uh, 25, I think, is when we lost you. Oh, okay. I'll go back to and I'll push that to the audience. Okay, so static formal knowledge like e-books, training manuals, and help files, they're all very good, but more often than not, they're out of date as soon as we put them into the knowledge base. And support analysts need to consume high volumes of information just to answer one single question. KCS addresses the need for dynamic informal knowledge, knowledge that focuses on questions being asked by the customers and answers and solutions are obtained collaboratively throughout the organisation. KCS says, ask me a question and I'll get you an answer. Now portability and interactivity has stepped up even more in recent years and this highlights the difference between knowledge just in case versus knowledge just in time. A tenet of KCS is that dynamic informal knowledge based content is different than static formal knowledge. Knowledge articles should be managed differently from other types of technical content like documentation and white papers and manuals. Knowledge is dynamic and it needs to be created, managed and delivered just in time to ensure accuracy and freshness. Now this is a very interesting chart. It represents the time value of knowledge. It, on the left hand side, it reflects the number of rediscoveries of new inc incidents as they go through their life cycle and new issues. It identifies that the value of support begins to diminish around about 30 days after the, the issue is first discovered. Unfortunately, in many non-KCS organisations, it takes 60 to 90 days to document and release new articles. Now this is an expensive proposition and misses the major portion of the content's window of opportunity. So KCS challenges the status quo. It demands that knowledge be treated as an asset and states that it's everybody's responsibility to participate in building that asset. KCS removes knowledge silos by rewarding those who share and contribute to the knowledge base. It removes knowledge bottlenecks like the expert vetting process, but rather promotes knowledge for all to interact with. It requires that knowledge be integrated into the support process and that every call be closed with a relevant linked knowledge base article. Style and formatting, spelling and flashy graphics are all good, but they're secondary to clear, concise instruction. KCS licenses knowledge through the organisation and schedules it into the workforce planning. Of course, this will require a culture shift. It's a movement away from a call-centric focus to a knowledge-centric focus. Support analysts are no longer employed to be just support analysts but rather knowledge agents, and their role is to identify the knowledge that your organisation does not yet have and capture it. Now, this could cause a lot of fear and a lot of resistance, and people may think, well, it's a waste of time or may even take longer, but this fear and resistance needs to be combated by pointing out the opportunities that arise when you capture knowledge, and their opportunities to do more your knowledge contribution creates opportunities for you and your team. It's definitely a shift. It's a shift from working as individuals to teams, from high volumes of activity to actually creating value. It's a shift from completing completion to evolution. This means that nothing is ever complete. So don't criticise poor quality knowledge articles. Just understand that it's evolved. It's evolving as you use it. Escalation to collaboration. That black hole that everyone escalates to, 
they too are involved in the completion and movement of that knowledge through its life cycle. It's an involvement from content to context. We've got more content than we can handle. Our only problem is, is that we don't have that wonderful context to encourage people to use that content. And finally, it's a shift from knowing to learning and sharing. So heroes or standouts in your teams are no longer those who possess the knowledge to resolve things that others cannot, but rather those who empower others by sharing that knowledge. Now there are four key concepts to KCS. Number one is to create knowledge just in time. And this is a byproduct of the problem solving process. Use the incident process as the basis of searching, capturing and creating knowledge. As soon as you find an issue that's not in the knowledge base, create it immediately. Tight integration of tool sets and processes ensure that knowledge is captured at the speed of conversation. Number two is evolve content based on demand and usage. Don't try to create knowledge outside of demand and don't commit to reviewing every knowledge article in the knowledge base. Let customer demand drive your attention to the articles that need adding or updating. Number three, develop a knowledge base of our collective experience to date. Your knowledge base reflects everything that we know. If it's not in the knowledge base, then we don't know about it. You as an individual may know about it, but the corporate we, we don't. Number four, reward learning, collaboration, sharing and improving knowledge. Now KCS as a methodology consists of a complex double loop process which centers everything around creation of knowledge base articles. The first loop called the solve loop is based on the operational activities and driven by the support process which is performed by individuals as part of their daily operational duties. And this can sometimes equate to hundreds if not, if not thousands of transactions per day. And the evolve loop which looks systematically at the content that is created through the solve loop. This is an organizational level view of the process and is intended to enable efficiencies in the solve loop. The solve loop contains four key practices. These cover capturing knowledge in the workflow, structuring knowledge to make it searchable and findable, reusing knowledge which highlights the importance of searching for the knowledge articles at the beginning of the support process and linking that knowledge to cases. And number four, improving knowledge, improving it as you use it. This is demand driven just in time quality. The Evolve loop also contains four practices which cover content health, having content standards, an article quality index and clear article life cycles. Process integration involves tight integration of knowledge support and the workflow and its technology. Performance assessment, having knowledge roles, licensing models and, and measuring our performance of knowledge as we go. And finally the most important, leadership and communication which talks about the critical role of leadership, teamwork, motivators and communication techniques. Now you may be thinking, well, that's an interesting concept and framework, but how does it actually work in real life? So when you'll notice on the screen there are two swim lanes. One of them is for the incident process and the other is for the knowledge process. There are three levels of support in the support value chain being the service desk, desktop support and the network and comms team. Now a customer rings up and they're getting error XYZ. The first thing the support process requires is that analysts search immediately in the knowledge base. Now in this example, the support analyst is unsuccessful and does not find any relevant knowledge. So as part of this process, they need to immediately create a framed knowledge base, sometimes called a work in progress or a WIP article 
with articles consists of a title and a minimum of an environment. Environment details like product, make, model and version. But that's it. WIP articles advertise this is a new issue for the organisation and they should then pin it to the case and then escalate it through to second level support. Now the desktop support team, they grab the call, they work on it and they not are notified that there is a work in progress article because of the red indicator on the incident record. They realise that this issue isn't solvable by them because they don't have the rights nor the privileges, but they understand that it's caused by a rights and privileges issue. So as part of the incident process, just before they escalate it through to the third level area, they add the cause. And it still remains in the work in progress status because there is no known solution. WIP articles are knowledge articles with no solution second level will escalate this through to the third level team and the network and comms team will work on the call and resolve it. But just before they close the call, they are required to interact with the knowledge article and they should update the knowledge base article to reflect the changes made. The update will be based on the confidence level of the support analyst. If the confidence is very low or they're confident that, that it will work once but maybe not all of the time, they will place the solution in draft mode. If they're confident that this article will always resolve most all, all problems, they will place it in the approved status. Now in traditional knowledge management, the status reflects who can see what knowledge base articles. But in KCS, it's completely different. With KCS, all support analysts can see all knowledge base articles. And the knowledge state advertises the level of trust and interaction that the support analyst should use. Work in progress knowledge base articles notify the organisation that we know about this problem, but we do not have a solution. Work in progress knowledge base articles speed up the escalation process and reduce rework. Draft knowledge base articles advertise to the organisation that we know about this issue and there is at least one solution that has worked before. But there's, a, there's low confidence in the article. So knowledge, uh, knowledge support analysts should validate its accuracy and record any exceptions. If they see any exceptions, they should fix it or flag it and escalate it for others to, re to review. Approved knowledge base articles means that there is a solution available and there is high confidence in the article. The confidence is either by high reuse or, es or validation through a subject matter expert. But we know that organisations change, that circumstances, environments change, so we just need to double check that this approved article is still valid. If we see any exceptions, we should either fix it immediately if we're licensed or flag it to be fixed later. Now in this scenario, the network and comms team resolve the call and then they close the incident record and it notifies the customer. Now the next time a different customer rings with exactly the same issue, as part of the search early and search often technique, the service desk search the knowledge base and voila, we have a knowledge article approved and we have first contact resolution. Now this solves a lot of escalation going, going through, through to the second and the third level support areas. And this escalation is reduced and these costs are, improved, are reduced and time is reduced and quality is improved, this is because we are capturing and reusing knowledge. This is a classic example of what we call shifting left. Shifting left is where you identify high volumes of repeat issues at second and third level support areas and shift them one step closer to the customer. Shift left also works at every level, even at the service desk. 
Here we can identify high volumes of information and move it one step closer to level zero being customer self-service. With customer self-service, customers can solve their own issues 24 by 7. This increases customer success, also increases support deflection and reduces the cost of support. Now some of you may be thinking, if everybody can see all knowledge base articles, then what about quality control? Accepting different approaches to quality is one of the hardest things to grasp in KCS. We seem to have no problem accepting and trusting information from blogs, news groups and social media feeds, but we seem to freeze up whenever trying to accept that knowledge articles too can be perfected iteratively over a collaborative demand cycle. You see, when it comes to knowledge, quality is so subjective. And the key statement of KCS regarding quality is it just needs to be sufficient to solve. This means good enough to solve the customer's issue. So remember this statement, sufficient to solve, not perfect to behold. It's not uncommon to hear escalation areas complain about poor quality KCS articles that are attached to calls when they're escalated to their teams. But they seem to forget that KCS articles are in a constant state of evolution. And they also seem to forget that they too are part of this evolution and quality process. You see, knowledge article quality will reflect the quality of the incident record that it's attached to. An incomplete incident will also have an incomplete knowledge article. So in truth, there should be no poor quality knowledge articles in the knowledge base that you as an individual know of, because as soon as you see something wrong with a knowledge article, you should be fixing it immediately. Now to achieve good KCS quality solutions, there's definitely a need to have some manual workarounds, but they are worth it. For success, you'll need to consider making adjustments to your tool set to your processes and to your culture to ensure that you capture, structure, store, retrieve and report on knowledge. Now you can't get around governance, having a formal process owner, community of practice, reports and monitors, and having a committed process improvement plan will ensure that knowledge as a process will remain healthy in your organisation. Consortium members who have implemented KCS in either internal or external support organisations have realised both quantifiable and qualitative benefits from adopting KCS. They've found that they can do things faster. They've also found that they can do more with less by optimising their staff. They've also found that they can leverage their knowledge by making it available and accessible by multiple channels of support. And by capturing the context of the support demand, we can guide specific development initiatives that remove the root cause of common issues or questions. Now from my personal experience, I can guarantee that using knowledge, and knowledge reuse improves first contact resolution, improves the mean time to resolution, and best of all, improves customer satisfaction. Now to help you better understand KCS, I've placed the first chapter of my online training video on Vimeo and also YouTube. I've also added an eight year case study which shows real life results of how KCS can help you. And you could also use it to support your business case. Please feel free to contact me on any of the social media networks. And from there, I'll pass on to Ashish and Monique. Thank you, Paul, for uh, such an excellent overview of knowledge management. I uh, completely agree with you that successful knowledge management implementations do require organizations to look at their implementations holistically in terms of people, processes, as well as technology. 
in that context, uh, I would like to introduce Monique Cadena from Avaya. Monique is responsible for driving knowledge center support at Avaya and has been with Avaya for several years. Now, Avaya should be a familiar name to most of you. They are a global leader in collaboration and communication solutions with a large support organization. They're an organization with a long history with several hundred products. Uh, products that vary from simple to extremely complex. Further, Avaya has a rich history dating back to the Bell era. So they have tens of gigabytes, gigabytes of support content, including product manuals that date back to 1980s. So now from a knowledge management perspective, Avaya was already quite mature in, in terms of their knowledge management expertise. In fact, several years ago, they started following KCS and invested in a dedicated knowledge management program and application. Yet they were running into challenges both on the KCS process and people aspect due to their technology. But now by switching to a new knowledge management application, which is Oracle Knowledge, they were able to make key process improvements and remove adoption barriers. The results have been quite dramatic as we've been working with them for uh, for past few months. And Monique has some great insights into what has made them successful. So without any further ado, let me pass you on to Monique so she can share this information to you. Monique? Thank you, Ashish, and thank you all for joining our webcast today. So some topics that I'll talk about today include what it was like before and after our KCS efforts, our technology evaluation and why it's important to have the right tools for your KCS efforts, our current KCS practices and approach, as well as some of the results that we've seen. To give you some background on our KCS history, I put together this timeline. Prior to what's shown here, we've always had some sort of KM program or knowledge base out of VIA. So our history dates back at least 20 years doing some kind of CAM. Our jump from traditional CAM to KCS started with our, our K Farms homegrown knowledge base in about May of 2006. We started seeding content and migrating content from some of the previous knowledge bases that we had. It was then migrated into Insight, which was our legacy system, in November of 2006. That was really our first attempt at incorporating the solve loop capture into our workflow, as well as the start of linking content back to cases. We had a limited ticketing integration, and it was customized by a third-party vendor. And we also had a very old-school workflow and a limited amount of people who could actually author content. We had the, this me approval and the publisher approval, which I'll talk about later. In November of 2011, we started our new technology kickoff efforts. And parallel to that, we were getting um, our support site redesigned as well. Both of these efforts were to help us increase adoption as well as address the technology issues we were seeing internally. In January of 2012, while we were working on the new Oracle Knowledge implementation with Oracle Consulting Services, we had a KCS certified trainer teach a foundations course for 20 of our KCS champions or advocates. And the KCS Academy taught a KCS leadership workshop to another 20 of our champions and managers. And this was really helpful because it allowed us to make changes to our requirements and streamline the new workflow that we were working on with Oracle at the time. Just a month later after that workshop, we were asked to make all 4,500 4, of our users KCS3 publishers, which means giving them permissions to publish directly to the external web. And after our employees in completed the training on our old legacy system, um, it, it wasn't very easy to implement, so we had to do a little bit of a workaround, but we were also able, able to get that change into Oracle Knowledge fairly easy and change the requirements during, during that time. So, we actually imported all of our users as KCS3 publishers so that when the Oracle Knowledge Base went live, our users would have the necessary permissions to be ready to start publishing on day one. And in March of 2012, we, want, we launched our new Oracle Knowledge, knowledge Base, uh, which we titled the Avaya Knowledge Base. And in April, we launched our new website. 
and um, the support site was integrated with the knowledge base search results as well as the product hub pages for each of the products. So the hub pages showed our top reused content that our engineers were linking to in addition to the having the art knowledge articles presented in our search results. This slide outlines some of our before and after results. Before we can, can, could continue our KCS journey and open bandwidth for the program team to spend time on KCS efforts, we had to address some of our roadblocks. So what we were looking to do was have KCS and associated technology move us from the, full, the before to the after state shown here. Overall, our legacy technology and process was very slow and cumbersome. And the causes of pain were both process and technology. So on the process side, we had too many gates to publishing. We were following the old CAM workflow where we had um, authors and a limited amount of authors who could create content. And once they created that, they had to submit it to a SME uh, subject matter expert who would do a technical validation and either reject it back or move it on to the next step, which was the publisher step. That was a dedicated team of people we had who looked at the article for spelling and grammar and format. So as you can see, we were kind of following the old you know, method of trying to get things to look perfect when it's not really necessary for KCS. KCS follows the principle, is it sufficient enough to solve? So we also had probably maybe 10 people that we entrusted was the ability to say, I can author and push this all the way out to publish without having to go through uh, a SME or a publisher for validation. Technology-wise, we had a lack of integration between the ticketing system and the knowledge base, as well as performance issues were with the standalone version of the knowledge base. And the impacts that we saw were all factors we had to consider. These, these were really big pain points for us, reliability, slowness in the technology, search accuracy, and linking issues, getting those known issues to link back to the cases. The impacts were the lack of engineers willing to participate in our KCS program. And so we ended up with the deep expertise stuck in their heads because the process was slow and cumbersome and they didn't want to waste their precious time fighting technology issues or, or waiting for slow responses. And then again, the old workflow, like I mentioned, it resulted in a backlog of thousands of completed articles waiting to be published or available to our clients and partners on our external support site. And after we were able to evolve our KCS practices and implement new technology, we were able to streamline the publishing process. So we now have true just-in-time publishing so our content is available now when it's needed. Um, Paul showed a slide there earlier of kind of, you know, the, the demand for content and when that arises in, in the timeline. And so uh, the, the Consortium for Services and Innovation actually even did a case study on our publishing program that's entitled uh, When Everyone Can Publish Featuring Avaya, and that's available on the CSI homepage, which we'll have a link to at the end of the slides. So our authors can now capture content capture content while it's fresh. And we went from 10 people being able to publish externally to over 4,500 people. So that's all of our support engineers. And once they do actually capture the content and publish it following the KCS process, internally it's available within, 20, within 12 hours and externally within 24 hours after the support index picks that up. And something else that we also did benefit from was going from a text-based uh, knowledge-based system to a multimedia um, support. And that really, it, it gave us the ability to share with clients and partners not just text content, but other things like slides and, and audio and real-life demos that our, our engineers have put put into an, what we call a video channel or a video article. And again, that's also integrated into our external support site as well. So what were the key players in helping us to grow and, and see so much success? 
Well, there were really two factors in my mind. One is KCS, following the KCS best practices, and the other was the Oracle Knowledge Implementation, which I'll discuss on the next slide. Um, KCS, many of the, the barriers we faced were related to building or evolving where we had started on our KCS um, journey several years ago. Previously, we had that system with very limited authoring rights in the old workflow that I mentioned. And even at one point, we had a knowledge base system where only an analyst, meaning somebody on the program team, could author or edit content. But that really didn't serve us well because we weren't getting um, the, the demand. We weren't finding what customers and clients and employees were really looking for. So over the last seven years, we shifted from that limited integration and implementation and to really start following the solve loop process um, of the KCS best practices where engineers could now capture structure reuse and improve content while they're working the case at the speed of conversation. However, the adoption was stunted due to the barriers in creating knowledge um, because we had many, many technology issues. And I know, you know KCS teaches that K KCS is not technology dependent. It's really about the people and the processes. And some companies have been very successful with some crew technology. However, at Avaya, our engineer base was really used to having speedy and user-friendly technology. So when they didn't have that and they came across issues, it, um, it, it did stunt our adoption. So we needed something that would support their quick pace and workflow. That, that was really the only um, thing that could probably get us past some of the complaints and, and what we were asking of them. So what we, once we got Oracle Knowledge, it allowed us to revamp and redeploy our KCS efforts. And we didn't get the engineering pushback that we had before because engineers saw a huge improvement in performance and they became more open to using it. In fact, they were even excited about it. We got a, a lot of compliments and uh, you know, they, they were glad that you know, there was another tool to help them really and enable them to do their job. So without these technology issues that we had before and the stumbling blocks behind us, we're able to focus a full circle on the KCS efforts and streamline our solve loop process as well as start working on the evolve loop activities that you see on the left here, which were somewhat limited before. So now we have the full circle KCS process that helps us to provide timely support to our clients and our engineers don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. So why Oracle Knowledge? Well, it came down to Oracle's ability to support our KCS initiative. During the selection process, the criteria that was important to us was that the application had to meet our current needs as well as scale for future needs. It also had to address the pain points that we were suffering at the time and technology um, and technically improve on the items that we were lacking so that we could spend more time focusing on the KCS program. And so why did we select Oracle um, from the various vendors that we looked at? It really came down to the four attributes that you see in the wheel here. Stability, speed, search accuracy, and integration with our ticketing system. And as part of the process, we did a time and motion study with our legacy system and compared it against Oracle Knowledge since one of our biggest pain points was speed. And so the outcome? You can see um, we charted the outcome here on this slide. And what we, we actually saw um, in, the ways of, in the way of speed was that new authoring templates um, were loading 84% faster. Creating an article, being able to select the metadata within that, that template was 70% faster. And search results returned 82% faster. Opening an article, once you got the search results, and that was 66% faster. So a huge, huge difference that, um, again, our engineers were very happy to see. Um, our performance usage increase, uh, meaning how often things were getting reused or new content was being created, that increased 25% in the six first months. And we were able to actually 
create over 14,000 new articles and publish those to resolve over 36,000 cases quickly and easily during those six months. And I know that sounds like a lot of content to a lot of companies, but again, um, as Ashish mentioned before, we have a huge product set. So that's, you know, right in line where we would expect it to see, to be. Um, and in, in addition to that increase, we saw our linking, meaning once a an engineer um, searches for content, either they find something that they can use as is or if they modify it and then get back to the case, that actually increased 20% from around 60 to 80% of our break six cases now have associated CAM content with them. And since we did the study, um, it's actually cre increased even higher. So some teams are seeing 95 to 100% in their linking usage. So what this all means for us is that it's um, much quicker to create and search for content, and we can significantly decrease our customer response time on repeat questions or have the customers and clients um, um, solutions themselves on the support site. And in addition to that, um, our, our engineers don't spend time you know, reinventing the, the wheel. They're able to focus on new issues and, and not have to answer the same questions you know, 10 times a day. And one of the big things that I, I really appreciate is that the program team, uh, we spend less time addressing technology issues and, and, and working with our IT de department to try to fix and test things. And we're able to spend more time on the KCS program, which is you know, giving us these benefits um, that we're able to see. And in fact, um, one of the things that we're working on right now is rolling out a in phases a KCS coach or mentor program. And in our pilot, this actually saved our engineers um, an average of two hours of direct labor per case. And the savings that we see, they keep climbing because as our engineers understand it better and become more proficient, they're able to solve these reused cases much more quickly. And so the goal, you know, of, of the program that we're, um, the, the point, the, the focus we're, we're doing right now with the, the mentor or coach role is to help the engineers truly understand the KCS practices. Even though we've had um, a long history of CAM at Avaya, um, the principles in the program right now are, are really to make sure that each person um, is, is truly understanding how to search early, search often, reuse content properly and modify rather than creating duplicates. And to when they do have to create content, that they're following the content standard. And in addition, something else that um, we're teaching them how to do that they really weren't so proficient in before is how to approve content, which you know Paul went over earlier. The approve state opens that up for your, your internal um, engineer base to see content that's still kind of a, um, a work in progress, but you're confident that um, you're making progress on something. So even though the issue is not resolved yet, it's searchable internally, which will allow others um, in different teams to see what you're working on. So that will really open the door for c collaboration. And so the moral of my story here is that do do everything that you can to follow the, the KCS best practices as defined by the consortium. There's a lot of experience and, and there's a lot of um, helpful information on their website, as well as choose a tool that follows, um, that really, I guess, follows what you're trying to accomplish and it allows you to um, meet your, tech, your process requirements as well as your technology requirements because I think the two are very, very important to have. Um, they really complement each other very well. And that's all I have today. Uh, Shish, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Sarah. So I've had an opportunity to evaluate several knowledge implementations over the past few years. And from my experience, I can tell you that the challenge implementations have similar characteristics. They consider technology as a separate pillar. They're often implemented as an afterthought and separate from people and processes, often siloed, by the way, and they're grafted on without consideration of impact on other two aspects. 
In my opinion, a successful knowledge implementation has its knowledge strategy based on proven knowledge methodologies such as KCS. The strategy also considers interdependence of the three pillars, people, process, and technology. Often the technology aspect, though, in corporations, it is governed by availability and compliance metrics. But it's extremely critical that the right technology is identified and the need for it be recognized. The right technology removes adoption barriers, it promotes usage, and enables process imp uh, improvements, as in a wires uh, example, where the search is now faster and accurate, and the authorship is driving the usage and the ROI. The knowledge integrated with their CRM uh, is driving adoption and process improvement, and they now have uh, a rich uh, multimedia customer service support portal as a result. So to sum it up, I strongly encourage and recommend customers uh, to adopt a sound knowledge strategy, um, in, such as the one KCS promotes, um, to ensure successful knowledge implementation and the ROI thereafter. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah, and then we'll open it up for questions. Sarah? Actually, before we do that, so thank you for your time today. There are some links here. Uh, you can download eBooks and white papers. You can chat with an expert here as well. So we love your feedback. Please feel free to uh, get back to us, and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Sir, over to you. I guess Sarah has. I think. I think. I guess Sarah. Sarah had a phone trouble. So, operator, can you please help us out with opening up the line for a question and answers? Okay, I, I think I, I see some of the questions coming in, and um, I'll start. The first one uh, is for Paul. Paul, there's a question from Tim Smith from Pacific Market. Who owns KCS in most organizations? Yeah, Tim, that's a, a fantastic question. Normally, just like any process, I recommend that you have a process owner or a process manager. Traditionally, when I go into an organisation, we do always have one person, one person who champions this uh, across the board uh, from an organisational level. And then we, that person, I, I even call them the KCS process owner because sometimes uh, you, you can have challenges with, other organisations have knowledge managers and then there can be some conflict. So I like to call them the KCS process owner. And they need to be uh, very influential. So it's always a risk when you place them into the service desk, which is traditionally where I see lots of those roles. But because they're working across multiple IT functions or multiple product-based support functions, they have to be able to influence all areas to participate within the knowledge process. So um, I'd always recommend that you have one owner, just like you would have an incident owner or a workforce planning owner in your organisation, but it really depends on the size of the organisation. But always try to have someone owning that KCS um, process, own, uh, the, the process. I always like to, the process owner is also in charge of the community of practice, which is made predominantly up by uh, KCS coaches and knowledge domain experts. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Paul. And uh, this is Sarah, and I am back. 
Uh, I'd like to direct the next question uh, over to Ashish. And if you could tell us what's the best way to create both an internal KCS for employees and an externally facing one for customers. And this comes from Tim at Pacific Market International. Great. Um, this is a great question, actually. So um, I think the gist of it is, first of all, we always promote what we call is a closed-loop experience, which exactly ties into ex Exposing knowledge, the same knowledge base on both ends of your service spectrum, starting from your customers uh, on your portal and going back to the agents which are supporting the customers uh, in case of escalation. So this is critical to have same knowledge base support the both ends. So that's the number one aspect. Uh, I also recommend uh, customers to focus on four pillars. Uh, in terms of knowledge management, which actually differentiate between knowledge management and, and traditional content management. Uh, these four pillars are content, delivery, collaboration and harvesting, and major, measurement, which is feedback in normal life. In content, uh, I recommend customers to focus on content acquisition and enhancement. You know, the, the idea is to keep it fluid. Keep your content fluid, don't keep it stale. From delivery perspective, make sure you have uh, uh, a way to search, uh, and then the search technology may differ. But the most important part of delivery is uh, deliver information and knowledge where it's needed and when it's needed. So delivering knowledge at the point of interaction is critical to achieve that experience. Otherwise, having a good knowledge, you're only going to get half of the benefits of it. Collaboration and harvesting, uh, this is how you would capture the tribal knowledge and also encourage the like-me scenarios where someone will come and say, hey, I also experienced the same problem, and here is what I did. You absolutely want to capture that. That's the tribal knowledge. You absolutely want to capture that. Right? Right. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, Monique, I'm going to uh, ask this of you uh, because I think that this is something that a lot of people you know, struggle with. And this comes from Dean at Liberty Bank. And the question is, with so many people publishing, how do you guarantee the quality of the materials? All right, so there's a, there's a, a couple things. Um, the first one is to develop a content standard, and, and these are really the rules that outline what belongs in an article and how to properly structure it and making sure that it contains enough information that's sufficient to solve. And so the best way to, to structure something per a KCS methodology is kind of like a recipe where you give it like an outline and points and easy steps to follow. And so we have that content standard defined, and then it also matches against, I think we have nine points in the content standard, it matches against nine checklist items in our AQI, which is our Article Quality Index. And that's something that um, needs to be manually done. So part of the KCS coach role is to take your, your team, um, and usually there's about 10 people per one coach, and periodically go and sample articles that they've created new. And then you do a check to see, um, is this matching this, this criteria? It, does it have the correct syntax? Does it contain enough information? Is it not a duplicate of another article? And so it's things like that. And so following those 10 um, check items, you get a score. And um, part of the process that we use to make sure people are going along the path is to kind of look at that score that they have. You know, if it's 100 percent, they're obviously doing well. And if they can maintain that over a couple, uh, a few weeks, then the frequency in which we do those audits then decreases. Um, the other, the other piece of that is again to to use that information not as a scoring of somebody in in what they're doing, but really to help identify the training opportunity, the pain point. Is there a lesson that this person can, can learn? And to help them overcome um, maybe the misconceptions or to understand really what they're being asked. And so it's, it's having the AQI done and it's having the coach who does the AQI really spend time with that person about an hour a week initially, and then it decreases as they become more proficient. So that's one way that we um, make sure that the quality is sufficient enough to solve. 
Thank you so much, Monique. And I'll make sure that we also give you some additional best practices because, again, I think that that and many other of the questions that unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to today really are around, you know, how do I implement this properly, you know, within my contact center? How do I ensure that quality? And how do I put, you know, some of those uh, just those parameters around knowledge and around the usage of it. So I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for questions for today. And again, if we didn't get to yours uh, or if you need some additional information on anything, please don't worry. Uh, we will answer all questions that are in the queue and we'll post an article on ICMI.com uh, in the next week which will answer all of those questions. And then shortly following today's live webinar, you'll be able to access and share this presentation on demand. You'll be able to download it from the console in PDF format. It is a large file, so we are unable to provide it to you in PowerPoint, uh, but you will be able to get it in PDF. And I do need to mention that this webinar is copyright 2013 by ICMI. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright, if that is the case, by ICMI, which is solely responsible for its content, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. So on behalf of ICMI, all of our great speakers and our sponsor, Oracle, we thank you for attending today.